Hey, this is Stefan Kinsella. This will be Kinsella on Liberty, episode 415, 415. Um, what I'm going to do today is this, uh, I'm going to like um, do a video commentary on a video recently produced by Larkin Rose on the question of intellectual property. So let me just lay the background before I start. Um, I'm using, by the way, this new Zoom create clip feature because I've never figured out the technical way to do video commentary. So I'm trying this. It may be crude, but hopefully it'll be um, sufficient. Um, so about a year ago, Larkin Rose, who is some uh, some um, libertarian writer um, or voluntarist or anarchist, um, um, I've met him at Porkfest. I've never read his stuff, so I, I, I just think he's you know, some libertarian activist type uh, writer. And he to his credit, opposes intellectual property, although I'm not sure his reasons make a lot of sense, but he, he seems to oppose intellectual property. Um, but he had some video like saying that, yes, if you pirate, you know, copyrighted content, then, you know, there shouldn't be copyright law, so you're not doing anything illegal, but you're still a, a jerk or a poop head, as he called it. So he's criticizing people for for, for, for copying free uh, public information. Uh, and I disagreed with that for various reasons because it's confused. And so I went on uh, Patrick Smith's uh, podcast, uh, which I'll link to in, in, the, in the show notes, um, with Larkin to discuss it. And, uh, you know, he ended up, kept, he kept saying that if you're a pirate, you're a jerk. And I, I, I said, well, I said something like, well, you know, you could make an argument that if you are a libertarian activist and your goal is to get the message out there and you write a book on liberty and you put it behind a paywall and you don't make it freely available like in a PDF copy, then you're being a jerk. Because if your mission is to spread the ideas of liberty, why would you restrict it to just, you know, rich Western white people who can afford who can afford it? You know, what about all the millions of people in Africa or, or Asia or, or, or the Middle East or, or South America? Don't we care about them? So I'm just saying from all I'm saying is, you know, you could make an argument that that your your priorities are misplaced, especially when you're selling a, a tiny little no name self-published book, which you're never believe. I've published lots of books. Some have made lots of money for legal legal publications. Some make very little money. So I know I know that it's you know these 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 no name libertarians who write these little self published tracks they don't make any money off of it they might make a little maybe a couple thousand bucks but so it's not like it's not like they're it's not like their main goal is to make money and if they do they're deluding them if they think that they're deluding themselves and even if they really are making money or think they want to make money off of it you know, if you put a free PDF of your book out online, it doesn't mean you can't keep making money selling the book like you were doing before. Lots of people will still buy it. In fact, it could increase sales. So I never said you don't have the right to put a paywall up. I never said you had a strong moral obligation. I simply said that, you know, if you're going to argue someone is a jerk for copying public information without any argument whatsoever, then you could easily argue that someone's a jerk for not being a good libertarian by putting fake elusive profits over spreading the message. That's all. Um, so that could just be an opinion. Um, so Larkin went crazy when I said this. He, he, was, he was shocked, started calling me a commie, <laughs> which is not. Um, anyway, fast forward a year later, I think he's been working on some movie called Jones Plantation, which um, mine, it looks just the trailer... It might not be quite as bad as Alongside Night and uh, the Atlas Shrug movies. Who knows? Um, anyway, he had a video about that. And apparently, here's, here's what I think happened. In his video, he's defending himself from basically paywalling the movie, like charging people to see it and not making it free online, and criticizing people that pirate it and upload it and things like that. Um, he's, he's, he's doing that in this video, and I think... He, he doesn't name names, except one party mentions me near the end. But he's very elusive. He doesn't give specifics. Uh, he's, he's a little bit uh, misdescriptive about the, 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 the YouTube takedown process that he mentions um, to try to uh, make it sound not as bad as it is. 
Um, so here's what I think happened. I think that um, the movie is done. They're going to have a premiere in a, in a couple of weeks in Dallas. And some copies have leaked, and some people are already leaking it on torrenting sites or something like that. So you can get a copy of the movie apparently right now if you happen to want to watch it. Um, so, uh, so apparently some people involved with the movie, and Larkin was a writer, I think, and maybe a bit actor in it. So he has some involvement in it. There's probably some people with money behind it. It must have cost something to make. I don't know. Um, so uh, apparently, uh, well, he sa he says, and we'll get to this. In the, when I'm going to play his video. By the way, the video is about 35 minutes long. I don't know if we'll get to the whole thing. It's a little tedious to watch because he repeats himself. He's a little confused. And I'm not trying to pick on, on poor Larkin here. Um, he's actually, to his credit, he says he's against IP, and he admirably sees that it can't extend to third parties who are not in privity of contract or something like that. So he sees that um, to his credit. Um, but I want to use this video and to go through his comments to show, to try to, uh, to, to, uh, to clarify some things because IP is a very difficult topic for people to understand. Um, and so people get confused about it all the time. They get confused about the DMCA. They get confused about Section 230, which is not copyright related. Uh, they get confused about contract and uh, the morals versus rights issue, self-ownership, labor theory of value, all these things. Um, but what I think happened was someone associated with the movie, maybe Larkin, maybe the, maybe someone else, they sent YouTube takedown notices, D, that's DMCA, D Digital Millennium Copyright Act, copyright takedown notices to YouTube and they took them down. And then apparently he got criticized by a bunch of uh, libertarian activists who, to their credit, understand that IP is evil. And they're thinking, what the hell is a bunch of anarchists doing using copyright to stop free speech, basically, right? Or freedom of uh, whatever. So, um, and so now he's being defensive about that. Um, now, I understand being defensive. I'm a patent attorney. I've made my living over the years by applying for patents, which is a system I think should not exist. And I either say, you know, fuck it, I'm not going to try to defend it, or here's my defense, you know, and I've, I've done this in other videos. But I try to be honest about it, you know, um, not try to change the nature of what it is. Now, in my case, uh, what I've done has been always defensive um, or neutral. So, uh, yeah, it's true, my career wouldn't exist if I had my way, and which is what I want, but... I can only do what I can do. Um, so if you're in a system where you're forced to use trademark law or the DMCA as part of your business model, okay. But don't pretend that it's just uh, enforcing a contract. It's not. That's what Larkin sort of implies later. Um, okay. So I'm going to get into his video. I'll stop it on occasion, and hopefully this, uh, this my technological approach will work well. So here we go. I'm going to press play and move my little window over here. Dallas, Texas, August 26th. That's two weeks from the day I'm posting this. There will be a screening of the Jones Plantation. Yeehaw. I will be there. Amanda will be there. Andrew, the director, will be there. The uh, guy who plays Mr. Jones will be there. I think we're going to have some other surprise guests of other people who are in the movie. I think. I'm not even sure who, but I think a couple more are going to be there. So if you don't yet have tickets to that and want to see it on the big screen, um, check the description below for the link of how to get tickets. August 26th, Dallas, Texas. I wanted to make a video that is kind of relevant to what's going on right now. Somebody uh, copied the, the Jones Plantation movie as we knew they would and stuck it on odyssey and someone else stuck it on youtube and uh, there were complaints and they took it down because to post it on those things you have to violate the conditions that you agreed to before posting there because both of those platforms and lots of platforms say if you if you're posting content somebody else made without their permission that's the violation of their own policies and so that's that's that but it, it Okay, so here's here's where he's already trying to spin it. Um, what? And I need to explain some things here. So, 
here's the way it works. There is copyright law in almost every country because of the Berne Convention, including the United States, and it censors free speech, and it's totally unlibertarian and evil, okay? Um, and because of the way the law works... Um, so when someone infringes copyright by publishing something that is someone else's copyrighted work without their permission, they're potentially liable for criminal and civil damages. You can go to prison um, for this. Um, and not only is the actual infringer, the direct infringer, potentially liable, but other people are potentially liable for your liability. That's called secondary or vicarious liability or responsibility. Um, and so when the internet started, there was a danger, there was a, there was a fear that uh, if you had this, you know, with the emerging internet, with, the, with the, um, the emergence of blogging and commenting, that if you had an, if you were an internet service provider called an ISP or a platform like, uh, let's say, Blogger or later YouTube or places like that, and you let, you let your users post content like a comment or an article or a video or a mute or an audio file or an image that if that was a copyright infringement, then the person who uploaded it could be liable, but you could be liable for what they did under secondary or vicarious liability for, for, for enabling it, right? Or for helping it. And the fear was that that would kill the internet because how could you have um, a blog and allow people to comment if someone could post a copyright infringing uh, image or something in the comments and you didn't do you didn't you didn't uh, ask them to do that but you have no control over it because you don't have the resources to monitor every post. So Congress and there was a concern about that for defamation as well if you post something that's defamatory. And so Congress enacted in 1996, I believe the. The Communications Decency Act. Sorry, my dog is barking. Uh, the, the CDA, under which has the Section 230 exemption for liability for defamatory contents of your users, and then in two years later, 1998. God. Okay. Shut the dogs up. Uh, um, so the CDA was the defamation exemption in 1998. These are all under Bill Clinton, I believe. Um, um, a similar exemption was given to platforms and ISPs and providers for copyright infringement. And they said, you're not secondarily liable for the copyright infringing acts of your users if you follow these steps, which is you have to immediately take down the content if you get a notice from someone pretending or purporting or, 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 or claiming to be the copyright holder. Um, and if you don't do that, then you lose your exemption and you might be liable. Now, YouTube... So this has led to this takedown system where YouTube takes down, I don't know, it's like a million a day. It's crazy because you have all these robots from all these media companies scouring videos. And if they detect a little thing, they just send a notice and then YouTube takes it down because they don't, they don't have the resources to investigate every one. And if they make a mistake, they lose their, they lose their exemption and they could be liable for hundreds of millions of dollars because the, the Statutory damages are $150,000 per act of infringement. I mean, it's crazy. So, um, and so that's why these companies have these policies. They have these policies just to avoid uh, being decimated by copyright law. The, these are not free market policies. These are not just a term of service. In a free market with no copyright, it's unimaginable that these companies would have similar policies. If YouTube had a policy that tried to mimic what copyright makes them do right now, then you would just have an Odyssey pop up or something, or Odyssey number three pop up, and they would say, well, we're not going to do that. You, anyone can post anything. We don't care. And so if I try to post a video on YouTube that the, the, the creator doesn't like, and he complains to YouTube, and YouTube takes it down because that's their free market terms of service, then I'm just going to go to Odyssey. So, so the YouTubes, the ones that have restricted policies, just wouldn't survive in a free market. So these are not free market policies, is my point. Um, so Larkin is trying to portray it that way. So, but the reason he's doing that is because later on he acknowledges that um, IP is bullshit, copyright is wrong. Uh, now, but if you have a contract with someone not to reveal information, that's legitimate, which I agree with. But he concedes that that doesn't bind third parties. So once the information gets out to the internet and gets becomes public, like on a torrent site or whatever, 
um, let's say someone breached their contract and they, they, they leaked it, which they shouldn't have done, but once they do it, the information is public. Now you have this mass of third parties who have no obligation to, they have no contract with the producer. Uh, if they did, they would be violating a contract, but they don't. So that's why that's why piracy is not uh, a legal offense or a crime under libertarian theory. And Larkin understands this. But what he's trying to do is he's trying to say, well, when you upload a video to YouTube, you're in breach of contract because you're breaching the agreement with YouTube, their terms of service. Now, so he, this, but this is just not the case. This is not what's going on. What's happening is that Larkin and his friends are using the power of copyright threats to tell YouTube and Odyssey, you cannot use your platform for this reason. So in other words, they're saying, hey, Odyssey, unless you take this video down, you could be, you could be subject to a copyright uh, infringement lawsuit because, because if you don't take this video down, we might sue the user who put the video up, and we might sue you for secondary liability because you're the host, and you don't have the exemption under the DMCA anymore because you refuse to take it down. So you see what's going on here. This is not just uh, innocent. Uh, this is not just um, uh, uh, bad users who are violating an agreement with the content creator. They might be breaching the terms of service with the host youtube or odyssey but those terms of service are there just as a def defense against copyright which shouldn't exist anyway let's go on it brings up the concept of intellectual property which to me brings up a wider concept because i don't believe in intellectual property but people do this weird thing of they they come up with these ideas and these concepts and they forget what they're based on. They forget what they came from. So basically, almost everything I talk about when they talk about politi political philosophy, it all stems from the idea of self-ownership. Even that is kind of a, a, a weird thing. And, and some people complain about, well, if I own myself, then I could sell myself. And well, you kind of can't. Uh, he's talking here about the um, the voluntary slavery thing, which is which is uh, uh, orthogonal to this. Uh, so he's right to dismiss that. Uh, but you'll see here he get, he's a little bit confused, like a lot of um, like a lot of libertarians are. Um, he 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 seems to glimpse that self ownership means ultimately just means a property right in your body. He never says it that way, but he sort of seems to get, get that. You'll see in a second. But um, he also then hints that yeah it means you also own what you create with your labor okay this is the labor theory of of, of property of Locke, which is why most people believe in intellectual property because they make that mistaken view they 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 make they, they mistakenly believe that you own yourself instead of your body right this is kind of holistic thing yourself and therefore you own your your labor that, that's the key mistake. I've, I've talked about this. I'll have this in the show notes, but this is Locke's big mistake, and it's confused everyone. Um, this is why I'm a little surprised that Larkin is against IP, because he seems to believe that you own your labor and you own the fruits of your labor, this metaphorical nonsense, um, which is why most people believe in IP. Uh, only thing I can think is he's such a staunch anarchist, and he hates the idea of state force that he, he senses that even if you own your labor, you just can't justify state force used against someone for not stealing a physical thing. I think it's something like that. But to his credit, he he seems to be against IP for whatever his reasons are. But his his concept of self ownership is not quite precise enough. Self ownership really means every person is the owner of his body. That's all it means. It does not mean that you own your labor. It does not mean you own the fruits of your labor. Now the reason for this latter point that this latter point is important and that it's true is because the only source of ownership, well, first of all, the only things that can be owned are scarce resources. And by this, we mean what I call conflictable material resources, scarce means of action, the types of things that are exclusively, that can only be exclusively used and that um, the use of which implies that, um, you know, if someone's using it, someone else cannot use it, right? So that means there's a potential for conflict over it. Um, so we need, as human actors in the world, to use scarce means 
which I call conflictable resources, to achieve our ends. Uh, and property rights are there to reduce or eliminate this conflict by allocating the, the ownership or the control of a given resource to a particular owner, right? And then you could, in principle, avoid conflict. So all property rights are ownership rights in tangible, scarce, material, conflictable resources. And they can only come from two sources. Number one is when there's a, a human actor who's already a self-owner, which means he's a body owner. So you have this human body, person, person body walking around who owns his body. And he's in a world with some things that are not yet appropriated or owned by anyone else, which means that no one else has a claim to the thing, which means that if he starts using it as one of his pursuits, then he can claim ownership of it because no one else can claim um, that he violated their rights because they would have to be the owner of it already for them to complain about him using the thing. Okay, so once you have a property rights system, Ownership initially comes from original appropriation or what some people call homesteading. So that's one source of ownership. Homesteading an unowned scarce resource, one. Number two is if you get it from a previous owner by contract. That's it. And a subsidiary would be if you get it from the owner because he owes you, uh, owes you uh, damages for, for committing a tort against you. But you could think of that as a subset of contract. But anyway, in, 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 the, in both those cases, you have, in the first case, you have someone becoming the first owner by getting something that no one else had a claim to, unowned resources. Second, um, and yes, by the way, you have to use your intellect and your labor to do that, but that's not because you, you don't own it because you own your labor. You don't own your labor. Labor is an action. You can't own actions. Actions are what you do with your body. Um, um, and, and so, uh, you own it because you are the first one to establish an objective link between yourself and the thing, and you can therefore have the claim that show you're the first user, and you have a better claim than any latecomer. That's the essence of property rights: is that current owners have a better claim than someone who takes it from them, for, takes it from them later. Um, and second, you can get it from a previous owner by their consent, only if they consensually agree to it, um, which could be a contract where I give you my car or I sell you my car. Uh, or if I, if I injure you negligently, let's say, and now I owe you some damages, so now some of my property becomes owned by you uh, so I can uh, give you rectification or restitution. Okay. But basically the point is the only sources of ownership is original appropriation of an unknown thing or contract. That's it. It's not creation and it's not labor. It's not production. Production is how we make wealth. Production just means transforming an existing thing that you already own. So if I have uh, some iron ore and I turn it into a, a, a plow, now I have increased my wealth because it's more useful to me or to my customers if I want to sell it. But the only way I own the plow is if I own the iron ore that went into it. If I'm on a factory working for, um, working for some plow company, then the, the owners, my employers are the ones that own the iron ore, and they're the ones that own the output, which is what I created with my effort, but I'm paid in a salary, right? I'm a wage slave, right, according to the, the left libertards. Um, you know, I'm an employee. But, but the point is, creation is not, a source of, it's not a source of property rights because it's not necessary. Again, if I find some iron ore in a field, I didn't create it, but I'm the owner because I'm the first. And again, if I make a plow using someone else's iron ore under contract as an employee, um, I'm not the owner of the plow. So creation is not sufficient. So creation has nothing to do with ownership. Creation is a source of wealth. So we have to distinguish wealth from property rights. All right, anyway, let's go on. And in but by self-ownership, I just mean, ownership means the exclusive right to decide what is done with something. And self-ownership, by that I mean, I get to decide what's done with this, with my time and effort and my body. And, and Notice, so he's, he's, getting, he's close to it. He's, he's, he's actually really good here on, he's right that the right 
property right means the, the he says exclusive right and technically it really means the right to exclude it just means the right to prevent property rights don't give you the right to do something with a thing because if i own a gun i don't have the absolute right to do whatever i want with it i can't point it into your yard and shoot at your house right just because i own it so it doesn't give me the right to use it it gives me the right to stop you from using it and this gives me the effective ability to use it in most cases right um but, he, but notice he throws in time and effort and all this like, no, now we're getting metaphorical. No, because he doesn't say the word body. He says this, points to himself. Um, this vague thing about this kind of agglomeration of concepts, myself, which is this loose thing. It's time, it's effort, maybe my mental creativity, my labor, my love, my, my thoughts, my hopes, my dreams. I don't know. I mean, th that's why we need to be precise. When we're talking about property... And law, I mean, law or, law are property rights that are legally enforceable. Notice the word force is in there. Force is a physical concept, right? You can only apply force. The legal system of whatever community you're in, whether it's private or, or government run, can only be applied to a tangible physical object because that's how physics works. Force is applied to physical things, right? So that's why, in the end, all property rights are about physical things and who gets it. So that's what self-ownership really has to mean. Because one criticism of the idea of self-ownership by very confused new age hippie California types is, well, how can you own something? How can you be a self-owner if you are yourself? It's like a contradiction, man. Like whenever someone starts talking that kind of bullshit, I hold onto my fucking wallet because they're coming for it, you know, ultimately. Um, the alternative to self-ownership is slavery. But what we mean by self-ownership is we have this we have this, uh, this humanistic concept of the person, the personality, the actor in human action terms. Uh, and that identifiable person is the one that has the property right in that body that's connected to that person. So you don't have to get into mysticism and all that kind of stuff. You just have to have to have a... So you don't have to be religious, for example, to believe that there's a distinction between the self and the body. Any more than that you're a mystic if you think there's a difference between the brain and the mind. I mean, my, my brain has a weight and a size and an age. My mind has no weight. A dead body has a brain, but it has no mind. You know, I can change my mind, but I can't change my brain. You know, I mean, concepts are different. Some are abstract and some are concrete. And they, they just apply to different things. And it doesn't mean there's not a relationship between them. Okay. But the point is, if we want to talk about property rights and justice and law, which is what these things are about, we're always talking about physical force. So then we're always talking about who is the owner of any contestable physical resource, including your body. So when we say you're a self-owner, it means you have the right to decide who can use your body, right? Who can touch your body, who can invade your body. I can consent to a surgeon cutting my body open, but if a mugger cuts my body open... Um, he's a trespasser, right? Because I didn't consent to that. So that's what self-ownership means. It means there's a person identifiable, associated with a human corporeal body, which corpus means body, um, who can decide who gets to use it. So Larkin is basically right, but he's wrong in going into all this metaphorical stuff about time and labor. I'm going to back it up for a and second. And everything else, what's something? And self-ownership, by that I mean, I get to decide what's done with this with my time and effort and my body and, and everything else, and nobody else has the right to, you know, violate my consent. And so what I produce with my time and energy is mine, and I can trade it with others and so on and so forth. Pretty basic concept. That's the, the foundation of individualism is that the individual has the right to control himself or owns himself for shorthand. So... Uh, when people come up with something like rights, for example, like I have a right to do this, and then other people say, you know, there's no such thing as rights. They're just made up things. Well, yeah, kind of, but no. The only way in which the concept of a right means anything is a statement of a negative. I've explained this before. To say I have the right to say what I want only means it's morally wrong for somebody else to forcibly stop me from being able to say what I want, the right. Okay, he's actually good here. Well, 
not completely, but he's 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 right about the rights being essentially negative. So when I have a right, it, it or, or in law we would say that it's correlative to a duty, right? So it just it just when I claim a right, it means it's it's, it's specifying what other people have no right to do. Now I think he's wrong in saying morally wrong. That's a little bit imprecise because uh, political philosophy and libertarian theory is not a moral philosophy. It's not about being morally wrong. I, I'm going to let that pass because that's not too much of an error, but it's not quite precisely right. Um, for example, people say the, the non-aggression principle means that it's we, we libertarians believe it's morally wrong to commit aggression. I don't think that's actually right. It's a little bit in the weeds, but I think the the view of, uh, say, Douglas Rasmussen and Douglas Denoyal is more correct in their uh, Liberty and Nature and other books. Uh, I think it's The Perfectionist Turn, uh, where they say that the right way to view what rights are is they're, they're not norms. In other words, norms are moral rules and moral norms are things that guide human action on a daily basis. That's what morality is for. Um, rights are meta norms. That is, they guide us into uh, deciding which laws are justified. That's what they're for. So when we say aggression, the non aggression principle really doesn't say that aggression is immoral. What it says is that um, that uh, no law that commits aggression is justified, right? Or the other way around, any law that aims to counter aggression is justified. Uh, that's what it means. Um, uh, so for, for uh, this is this is too far afield. So I'm going to let that go for now. But um, but um, yeah, let, let let's keep going. Right to be armed. All that means is it's morally wrong for somebody to forcibly disarm you for no good reason. Like, yeah, instead of saying morally wrong, I would say that um, that um, anyone who uses force to take my gun away is violating my rights, or any law that stops you from doing it is an unjust law. That's that's how I would say. It. Instead of calling it morally wrong, but that's a, a little detail. When you haven't threatened or harmed anybody. Um, but these concepts come along, and then when, for example, people talk about rights, they talk about them as if there's like this pile of rights you have. That, And if you keep in mind where the concept came from and the, the logic that led to it, it makes a lot more sense. Otherwise, you start clinging to ideas that when you forget where it came from, the ideas take on a life of their own. But then when they don't make sense, people cling to them anyway. Um, I, an example I could use is like the concept of gravity is like, well, uh, gravity says things go down. Well, no, actually gravity says that everything with mass protons and new. I, I already listened to this one time. So I, th so I think his gravity example is not horrible, but it's just not, ap it's not applicable. I mean, he's not bad. He's not completely wrong about gravity. Uh, but he's just, I think he's wrong on where he's heading with this. He's. He's trying to find an out for himself to, to defend himself from, from criticism from anti-IP libertarians who see that it is wrong to use copyright to censor speech. That's it. And he's, he's going to do that by saying that people like me, and apparently these nameless people he won't name, um, um, who say that you're being immoral or being a bad person or just being criticized uh, for paywalling stuff, um, he's he, he's he's saying that that they're claiming that that you're you're doing something. They're we're, they're, they're they're violating our rights. We're not claiming that. And because he doesn't name anyone by name, he he can he can then straw man things because he you can't pin him down as to what examples he's got in mind. So he can make these. These false accusations against straw men who are not even saying what he's claiming that they say. Right? Again, like me, in our earlier talk, and then in later in this talk, when he gets to me, he claims that I'm a commie because I claim that you are have an ob some kind of some kind of legal obligation to uh, to not have paywalls. That's not my view at all. I never said that. And it's not implied by anything that I said. All right, let's go on. Neutrons. And every other thing, basically every combination of two things with mass has a pole between them that is 
inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them, and, and you can have the whole equation of g m1 m2 over r squared, or d squared, depending on which one you're doing. That's the actual concept of gravity that's measurable and repeatable. But if somebody just says, oh, uh, things go down, that's gravity, and then you show them a, a helium balloon and it goes up, Oh my god, there isn't gravity, because a helium balloon just went up. No, actually, it goes up because of gravity, but you have to understand things like density and the, 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 the mass of air versus the mass of helium. The whole reason it goes up is because helium has a lower mass um, at room temperature than air, so the air is actually falling down and pushing it up the same way a bubble goes up in a pool. So anyway, the point is, if you oversimplify a concept and you think the rule of gravity is that things go down, and then you find something that doesn't fit that, if you don't know where the, the, the concept or the idea came from, then you just go, uh -huh. but if you watch where it came from, it makes perfect sense. So how does this tie into the concept of intellectual property? Well, intellectual property isn't exactly a thing, but a lot of people think in terms of is it property or not? And nothing. Okay, it's not that it's not a thing. I know this is this is extemporaneous comments by him. Intellectual property law is a is a thing. It exists. What we mean is intellectual property laws are not just. That means they're not compatible with libertarian law or libertarian rights. That's what that's what we mean. We say it's not a thing. Thing else, and they people think in terms of. Is it property or not? And nothing else, and they forget where all of the concepts came from. And this is another little mistake. It's not, it, it, the criticism of, this is not his fault. Everyone makes this mistake. The criticism of intellectual property is not that it's not property. I mean, the word property, to be precise, should be reserved for the, for the, for the reference to the relationship between an own, a human actor, owner, and an ownable thing. A resource. So I have a property right in a thing. The thing is not property. Property is the relationship between me and the thing. But we get sloppy and we call things property. Like we'll say, um, like we'll say that like that gun is that gun is my property. The reason that 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 mis that, that that casual colloquial usage arose, I believe, is because. The reason we employ these scarce means is to extend our reach into the world to, to use the causal laws that we're aware of to achieve our ends. And over time, the things that we use, like our clothing, our food, our homes, our tools, our weapons, um, they become a property of ourselves, like a feature of ourselves, a characteristic of ourselves, because they extend our, our ability to reach into the world and to do things. That's all. So... We start calling like, um, yeah, like that gun is a property of Kinsella because it describes what Kinsella can do, right? It's like K Kinsella has many properties. He's five foot seven. He's he's uh, he's American. He's born in this year. Whatever. That's what that's my properties. My he has a certain weight, uh, a certain educational background, whatever, right? Uh, a certain set of, and, and and one of my properties is I can I can shoot. I can shoot that rabbit because I have a gun, right? So we start calling the gun my property. And then and there's nothing wrong with that if you're if you're aware of the reason for this casual shift in language. But technically speaking, it'd be better to say Stefan Casella has a property right or an ownership right in that gun, or Stefan Casella owns that gun, instead of calling the gun my property. Because then people start saying, well, the problem with intellectual property is ideas aren't property. It's like, well, it's, it's not that they're not property. It's, and plus the word property is in there because that's what the pro-socialist, you know, the pro-IP types have done. They've turned these terms like patent, trademark, and copyright, and trade secret, which are all distinct bodies of law. And patent and copyright used to be called intellectual privileges or intellectual monopolies. Or monopolies, they they started using the term intellectual property to describe all of them, but that was just a propaganda move to to overcome opposition and hostility to patent and copyright in the 1800s by the free market economists who who recognized that this was crazy that we the government's granting these monopoly privilege grants, um, 
for, for, for writings and for novels and for inventions, right? So they, they started opposing it, and the, the industries that had become entrenched in this and the people that had been confused by the Lockean labor theory of property and utilitarianism and technocracy all started defending the existing patent and copyright system by saying that they're really natural property rights, but they're a special type called intellectual property. And now you have people that sense that there's something wrong and they want to defend it. They want to oppose IP rights and they say, well, it's not real property. But that's not really the argument. But that's what you don't understand if you don't have a deep understanding of IP, which no one does because it's so arcane. No one understands antitrust law, administrative law, uh, Indian affairs law, <laughs> even con law, to be honest. It's so arcane and crazy. And not it's not law. None of it's real law. It's all bullshit. All right, let's go. So, for example, if I write a song and it's out there and somebody copies it, and then they have a copy of the song, I didn't lose anything. I still have my song. So it's not the same as if I own a car and somebody takes my car. They have my car. I don't have my car. They stole it. Ding, 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 ding. Point one for Larkin. Really good. You're, you're correct here. So ideas and information don't function the same way as property. So yeah, intellectual property isn't... That's correct. I have some posts, and it's in my, my upcoming book uh, where I talk about this. Um, if you think about human action in praxeological terms, like Mises would do, or Hoppe, um, all human action is the, is the effort by a human actor, that is a, a, a sapient being, you know, having some control over a corpus, a body, and some interaction with the world, and some awareness of what's going on, and some awareness of the future that's coming, and some dissatisfaction with the future that he thinks is coming, and some knowledge of causal laws and his available resources. And so what he does is he, he, he identifies an end that is a future thing he wants to change. Like he thinks that, oh, he, he detects that he's hungry because he senses that from his stomach. <laughs> and he, he, he extrapolates with his rational ability and his, knowledge, his empirical knowledge that if I don't do something about this in, in a few hours or a couple days, I'm going to be dead or I'm going to be really hungry. And so he wants to change that. So he sees a future world coming with him being hungry or dead, and he doesn't like that. It gives him uneasiness, as Mises called it, felt uneasiness. So he thinks, well, I'm aware that if I feed myself, I can alleviate this. And I'm aware that one way to do that is to make a fishing net and go down to that river and catch a fish and eat the fish. So he employs means to do it. But you notice that the two components of that action that are critical but distinct is, number one, the availability of some scarce means. That is, means that can help him achieve his goal. Like there's fish, and there's, an, there's material to make a net. Um, and his knowledge. He has to be, have knowledge of the cause of his hunger and the solution to it and how to, how to achieve that. Like he knows he can grab a stick and grab some 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 fiber some some leaves and make fibers or whatever make a net he can he can go he can use his body to walk to the river and catch a fish and eat it so you have to have both knowledge and scarce means which he Larkin here calls property i would call it scarce resources cuz this this could apply to Crusoe on a desert island where there's no property rights it's just scarce resources so we're always talking about scarce or conflictable means of action or resources so, but they're not enough. You have to have knowledge, right? So knowledge guides action. Action employs means. So those two things are both essential and critical for any successful action. He's not wrong here. I'm just clarifying. A thing. And you can, you can do all sorts of examples. Like if I, if I learn about some clever way to, like if I tell someone a trick for how to drive on in ice and snow and they're not used to it, and they go, oh, okay, thanks. They'll say, yeah, but you have to pay me a dollar every time you do it. It's like, what? no. Like, I have the idea in my own head now. You explained it to me. Now I understand it. You don't get to charge me for something I know just because it came from you. That's ridiculous. And He's right here. He's 100% right here. But this applies to piracy as well. Like, if, if, if you make a movie like Larkin and his buddies did, and... If you don't keep it under wraps enough, 
that it's going to leak, which he admits it's going to leak, and it's going to leak because he wants to show it. <laughs> he doesn't want to keep it secret for five friends to look at. He wants to show it to make money or to get publicity or whatever, which I totally understand. But the risk of that is it's going to leak because it's impossible to keep information uh, chained down. It's just impossible. Um, and by the way, these contracts he's talking about, I don't think he's going to make people going into the movie have a contract. I don't think that when he, anyone uploading the movie, he didn't have a contract with any of those. And if he tried to make them sign a contract, they would say, fuck you, right? I'll wait for it to be pirated and I'll get it that way. I'm not going to sign a goddamn contract. Anyway, um, hold on. So he's right that it would be ridiculous for me to say, well, you have information about how to drive better on ice or whatever. And now you have to pay me, I don't know, a dollar or like, but the problem is, like, why would it be a dollar? Why not a million dollars? Why not a penny? I mean, the numbers are arbitrary. I think we get used to the typical fees charged in the copyright system for, you know, for Amazon to rent you a movie for a day, which is like three or five bucks. So is that supposed to be a fair market value for using an idea? Why would it be a dollar? But this is the point. In, in, in other comments, I think it's in this video or maybe the others, you know, they have this idea that, um, well, oh, I, I was actually wrong earlier. It wasn't about his book. It was about the, anar it was about the anarchist, the HBO show, The Anarchist. Or the earlier uh, poophead thing was about libertarians copying the anarchist HBO video, pirating that. So he was like, why not just throw a couple of dollars to HBO, which I guess means their $20 a month subscription fee. And I'm like, well, why would it be $20? Why? Why do I need to throw a couple of dollars to a copyright whore corporation, which the lefties, you lefties don't even like anyway? Why not just send a couple of bucks to the anarchist producers by PayPal and then pirate HBO, say, fuck you to HBO? I mean, but, th but then that means that, so what, what they're saying is if you're a libertarian in support of other libertarians trying to do things to get the message out and part of their project requires them, part of their project is them doing a, a project that they need to make a profit on to be sustainable, then you have an obligation to support them. Well, that's nothing more than asking for charity. That's like saying, well, I have this new think tank and I'm starting it and the only way I'm going to succeed is if people donate money to me. Okay. So everyone has an obligation to support me. It's like, really? How much? Why you? There's a million charities in the world. Okay. I, it's not bad if I can support you. But if I don't support you, I've, I've done nothing wrong. I'm not a jerk if I don't support you. Or if I free ride. There's nothing wrong with free riding. Everything we do in society, other people benefit from without paying for it. No big deal. All right, let's go on. And I wouldn't have the right to use force against them every time they drive in the snow and use the trick without paying me. That's stupid. So that that's a, the, an example of that's not my property. That idea isn't, I'm not the only one who has the right to use that idea. So Yes, he's correct. And once your movie gets out on the torrents, you're not the one who has the right to tell anyone what to do with it. I mean, as Benjamin Tucker said, and as Wendy McElroy points out, if you want to keep your idea to yourself, keep it to yourself. Information is something that can spread. It can be copied. That's its nature. People can learn from it. They can build on it. They can discard it. They can consume it. You know, they can change it. <laughs> and that's the nature of information and knowledge. And there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. If you decide to let your information become public, then you can't really complain when people use it because it's not yours. Because information cannot be owned. As in your lingo, it's not property. But what I would say is, you know, the, the only things that are the subject of property rights are scarce resources, conflictable resources, and they can be owned only by original appropriation or by contract. That leaves no room for ownership of ideas because ideas don't exist in the world. They're just patterns of information embedded on a substrate or a carrier, like your brain or a magnetic tape or an LP or a physical paper book with ink patterns on it, or a CD, CD-ROM with pits and lands that reflect light in different ways, right? Or 
or, or computer memory chips with transistors that, uh, that, that store ones and zeros. All these things are physical things that are substrates that are real physical scarce objects in the world that someone owns. And they own the thing, but they don't own the way it's arranged. Right? They don't own the properties of things or the characteristics of things. If I own a red Porsche, I own that particular red Porsche. I don't own red. That's a character or a feature or a property of my car. I don't own its 3,000 pound weight. I don't own its horsepower. <laughs> I don't own its age. Right? I don't own its mass. I own that particular car. So we got to stop thinking that we own properties of things. If I own my body, I don't own what it does. I don't own labor. Labor is an action. To say I own an action is nonsensical. If I own my body, I can go take a jog with it. Doesn't mean I own jogging. If I own a red car, it doesn't mean I own red. If I own red, it'd be a universal, meaning I own everything red in the world. That's crazy. Which means I would be stealing the property. If someone else has a red bicycle, now I own their bicycle. But I thought they owned their bicycle. You know why? Because the only source of property rights is original appropriation or contract. And just because I have a red car doesn't mean I appropriated that bicycle or, or created it from raw materials or bought it from anyone by contract. I just happen to have something similar. Same thing is true with, and, and this is why information cannot be owned, because information is always the impatterning of a substrate which is owned. So no one can ever own information, or as Larkin might say, it's not property. I would say it's just not the type of existent thing to which property rights can apply. It can't be a subject of property rights. Let's go on. So I, you know, that's kind of obvious. And that's why people say intellectual property isn't a thing. But if you forget where it... Well, we don't say it's not a thing. We say it's unjust, but okay. ...came from, you start to argue stupid stuff. For example, if, let's just make up a hypothetical, let's say I and some people I know made a movie. Hmm, you might be able to imagine that. We're not obligated to give it to anybody. No, you're not. And no one says you are. So this is the straw man. I don't say you're obligated to. Especially for a movie. For, for a book, you, you know, for, for a little 90-page self-published, uh, uh, badly edited uh, uh, screed, you're not going to make any money on that anyway, right? So that's why I was saying you could make an argument that if you want people to understand what you think are important ideas of liberty... Why wouldn't you open? Why wouldn't at least a year later you put it free online in PDF? Why wouldn't you make it easy for people in Africa to, or, you know, or poor or poor students somewhere to find it? Why? I'm, I mean, I really don't understand it. I wouldn't be a libertarian if I didn't believe in this because believe me, I don't get money for this stuff. This is a hobby which I support with my other career, and I'm happy to do it. I donate money to other libertarian causes. So why would you? Why would you spend all your time writing a book and try to keep it? paywalled where only rich Westerners can see it. It makes, it just makes no sense to me. Doesn't mean you have an obligation, but it means like, well, you're, then your goal is not really to spread liberty, is it? Um, now for a movie like this, where it takes a big cost to hire actors and to get production, um, uh, the only way it's feasible is if you somehow either fund it with your own money or you sell tickets or you get donors. Um, so you're, so your goal there is not completely uh, message based. Partly is to to um, to make money, which there's nothing there's nothing wrong with making money or having a profit motive. But you can only do it as a libertarian in a just way, right? So you shouldn't be using DMCA takedowns. Number one, that's the problem, right? Having a paywall is not the problem. So this is the subtle sort of shift here. No one is saying you have an obligation to release it for free to the world tomorrow. Right now, I personally think that in a couple of years, when the tail has died out on this thing and it's not selling anything, maybe make it free. Then, of course, you don't need to because the magic of information is that it can be copied and pirated, and it's going to be available anyway. If anyone really wants to see this movie, I don't know. Um, let's go on. Unless somebody actually like made a deal ahead of time, like if if people donated with the agreement, they get a copy, then they get a copy, like. But if, if we just make something, 
we don't have any obligation to give it to anyone. Like we created it when we have control over it. Nobody's entitled to it. He's correct. No one's entitled to it. But if you make it public enough or you distribute it to enough people that it, it will be leaked, and you know this, and then there's a leaked copy on the internet, then someone who can access that has no obligation not to copy it either, Larkin. And it's the same thing as like, oh, if I'm just playing the piano in my, you know, my house. I'm just sitting here playing the keyboard or something. Well, that's not your property, so we have a right to hear it. <laughs> so we it's not the same thing. You can close your drapes because you have the right to control your drapes. That, that's how you can stop people from, from hearing you play or, or you know, keep your, keep your doors locked. But to stop people from copying your movie on Odyssey, you have to send a DMCA copyright takedown notice. That's a difference. One means is legitimate, one's not. You have a right to barge in. No, you don't have a right to barge in. I don't have any obligation to ever play it for anybody or let anybody hear it. I have the right to keep everybody out. And if I record it, I don't have an obligation to give it to anybody. No, you don't. But if you release that recording to enough people where it's likely it will be leaked by one of them in violation of a contract maybe or a confidentiality agreement or an obligation, um, then you have, you, have a, you have enabled it to be released to the public and you can't complain about that once it gets out. You can complain about the people who violated your trust, but you can't complain about third parties using public information, which you've already agreed to this. You've already said that there's no contract with uh, the third party. By the way, I'm at uh, my current. I'm at almost an hour now, and I'm only eight minutes into his 35-minute video. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop, and then I'm going to do a part two, maybe a part three. I think it'll go faster as we go further along. I'll just let his talk go on and on because uh, I think I've kind of covered most of his, the things he says that I think are confused. Um, so I'm going to stop here with part one and part two will start in the next episode.